Welcome to Talk 7 of the Dr. James Cousins Lecture Series on Southern Alberta History, recorded in 1974. Today he talks about the newly arrived Mormons. And this innocuous little article in the news of July the 6th, 1887, simply says, Twelve families came in from Montana and have settled on Lee's Creek and St. Mary's River. That's all. Plunk. They were wrong because they didn't come from Montana, but after all that, Montana is the next place down, so they came from that direction, so they must have come from Montana. Um, and it took quite a while before they even mentioned who these people were, and it's surprising because this was the first farm group coming in to do actual farming instead of ranching, uh, the farm settlement. And there was another one about a year later, uh, the German settlement south of Dun Dunsmore. And I, I, I haven't been able to find anything more about that. I'll have to talk to the Medicine Hat historians and find out if that colony survived and if there are remnants of it still today. But those were the first two uh, farm settlements in this, uh, in this area. Uh, now, it wasn't until August the 10th, now that was July the 6th, that the editor recognizes that these settlers are Mormons because an article in the Montreal Star had applied that this was a very implied that this was a very undesirable development with the insistence that they must obey our laws, uh, referring, of course, to polygamy. So the editor immediately defended the newcomers as good settlers. And later, in August the 17th, the editor copied an article from the Gazette describing a trip made by C.E.D. Wood down to the settlement, and he found there were 18 families and 42 souls on Lee's Creek. I always laugh about that word, souls. It's a favorite word in the late part of the 19th century. To me, souls are things that have left the body already. <laughs> it sounds a little ghostly. Um, wells had been dug, fences were up, and the land was broken. They had already built a bridge across Lee's Creek and were petitioning for a post office, as recommended by Mr. D.W. Davis, M.P. The post office was to be called Charlestown, and a later article from the same source in September described a visit on July the 30th when 12 homes were already going up. Mr. Card was interviewed, and he thought that the soil here was better than it was down in Utah, um, which, of course, he knew the editor would be pleased to know, <laughs> because boosts do not knock is the slogan of all newspapers in the West. In the meantime, the newspapers from afar continued their attacks on government immigration policy. One attack by Frank Oliver's Edmonton Bulletin raised replies from both the news and the Gazette. Of course, said the news, we are not in favor of polygamy, mind you. But, apart from all that, well, on October the 19th, the arrival of 21 more Mormon settlers was noted, and nothing more appeared until March 29th of 1888, when S.J. Dennis, in his report as Inspector of Surveys, noted that there were 12 families of 60 souls, <laughs> there they go again, erecting a village on C.O. Card's homestead and preemption. Uh, this is for the younger uh, kids, you know. You could take out a homestead for $10. You bet the government $10 you could stay on it. Uh, for so long, and then you had the opportunity to preempt, to take out the right on another quarter section, provided, well, there was some sort of rule about it being adjoining or something, or very close to, uh, and you had to live within so many miles of your homestead and all the rest of it. And the preemption was uh, <clears throat> quite a favorite way. I used to laugh at the, um, at the Ukrainian people. Uh, when they bought land, after they got their homestead, most of the land they bought was from the CPR. So they called any land that they purchased CPR, and any land that they got free, that was Homestead. So, so, so they had Homestead, and they had CPR. So I'd go to the farm, and I'd say uh, to the boy, where's your dad? I don't know, he was uh, working on Homestead, and now he's gone out to CPR someplace. <laughs> and they, they had a very quaint accent out of it. I can imitate them very, very easily, because I talked to them for so many years, and they <laughs> little Irish came out. It was a beautiful dialect, it's completely English, not broken English, but uh, it, it had a, a sort of a chopped off way. Where do you go going? You know, Ukrainian idiom sometimes, but always in, in English. So the CPR was what land that you bought. He could buy it from that's a bay company, but still a CPR. <laughs> but this is, when you go into a strange country, you hear strange words and you apply them. And CPR was one of them. Well, that's the preemptions that these fellows are talking about here. Uh, us old fellows, we know all about preemptions grip and all that sort of stuff. Well, um, 
Now, I suppose things would have gone along very quietly and uh, the Mormons would have settled in with maybe a few little rustles here and there if it hadn't been for a little gadfly named A. Maitland Stenhouse who appeared on the scene and uh, apparently the Victoria Times must have been running a feud with him because um, they gave great play to the fact that Mr. Stenhouse had been converted to Mormonism. Now, as Mr. Stenhouse had recently come to Lee's Creek, he swims into our orbit, orbit because he was a tremendous letter writer. Meanwhile, the co <laughs> that reminds me, there's a letter by Mr. Spencer in the paper today. <laughs> the Spencers uh, of, of today were the Stenhouses of yore. The only difference <laughs> is that uh, Mr. Stenhouse was uh, a slightly different type of writer. Now, in the meantime, of course, uh, the colony was getting perturbed over the lack of mail service because this forced them to come into Lethbridge quite a long way by their wagons and buckies. It was suggested that a weekly or fortnightly service from Lethbridge or McLeod could easily be arranged. But um, nothing happened for quite a while. And on June the 14th, the news <coughs> announced the arrival of a new citizen at Lee's Creek who would not be bothering about homesteads or preemption for some time. And this was a daughter born to Mr. Card on June the 11th. And the editor implied that the father was bursting his buttons with pride. Uh, Mr. Palmer, Dr. Palmer, told me that this lady is still alive, and Mrs. Brown, I think he said her name was, uh, living down in Utah. It's rather interesting to see her birth announcement because she must be a very, very old lady now. Uh, and there was a special note that the Mormons on Lee's Creek were holding a big sports day. And uh, I noticed that Dr. Palmer has this in his book, too, uh, on Mormon Church in Canada, on July the 1st. This is interesting because uh, when the Great Settlement came after 1905, the people down in Coots used to have picnics every year, the Dakota picnic, they called it, on the 4th of July. But uh, uh, the, the Mormon people were a little too... Cagey, you see, they, they weren't going to try to, well, be as high as a kite on the 4th of July or whatever it is. No, it sounds more like a Canadian than uh, an American. Well, um, and you notice that very soon the Mormons were doing work around to gain extra money, hauling hay for the police from Col the Coltman brothers, haystacks, and uh, somewhere... About November 1888, they seemed to get some type of mail service. Now, um, about all that the, the editor would report, you know, the, the, the uh, Mormon teams are hauling hay and this sort of thing, this little baby was born. But then, Mr. Stenhouse decided to take pen in hand. Uh, the colony wanted to get land outside of homesteads and preemptions in a block so that they could have a sort of community property. This was an idea of the church for a while, and it was given up later. Well, the news editor was opposed because he said he wanted the Mormons to be given the same privileges in land owning as other citizens, but no more. Uh, because in spite of the correspondence, it was a dead issue from the start because the same question had come up in regard to the Mennonites in Manitoba in the 1870s, and the whole thing had simply been settled, a, a, a tradition had been set up, and uh, they didn't permit that type of colony. But Mr. Stanhouse didn't know when he was beaten, so he took up cudgels and entered into combat with Mr. Saunders on the rights of settlers. This was December the 26th, 1888. Even so, the editor wonders why Lee's Creek still had no main mail service by February of 1889. <laughs> you know, in the middle of battle, you see, you stop for a drink. Uh, well... Uh, in May, an Ottawa dispatch stated that the large influx of Mormons into Alberta was expected soon, and they said no proof has yet been obtained that polygamy ha is practiced. Um, I spelled it the way the editor did, and my secretary corrected it, so I've got S-I-C, meaning yes, after the word that isn't spelled wrong. <laughs> this is what secretaries do. I, I'll have to tell her what six stands for, and then she won't correct the spelling next time. Okay. Um, the incongruity of articles is sometimes amusing because um, you'll see this article. Mormon fresh butter, very choice, is featured at Bentley's. The following week, 12 or more new families arrived at Lee's Creek. September, 
The first team thrasher for this district arrived today from Mr. C. O. Card of Leech Creek. It is a 12 horsepower engine from Oshawa. Canadian made, see. Uh, but these are all these funny little articles, and I've just picked them out one after the other and stuck them down, uh, so we know there. Well, Mr. Stenhouse wrote the letters, but then he decided to get off on a kick of polygamy. So in, 19, in October the 23rd, the news copied an item from the weekly Victorian. And this is what it says about, now, the, the, the Victoria people, as I told you, had a feud going with Stenhouse. He'd been an MLA, or a member of the provincial parliament. Is that what they call him, the BC MPP? But anyway, he was a member from Com Comox, and this is what they've got. A. Maitland Stenhouse, ex-MPP of Comox, is now a burning and shining light in the Mormon colony near Lethbridge. Um, he is actively engaged in canvassing Alberta with a view of representing that district in the Dominion Parliament. His aim is to secure reforms in the marriage laws and political immunities for his co-religionists. But if A. Maitland Stenhouse thinks he is going to, in to induce the Dominion Parliament to allow him to take unto himself half a dozen or more wives, he is fooling himself. <laughs> Stenhouse is of the Zacchaeus order. He is a very small man, and it is only reasonable to suppose that one helpmate would suffice him. <laughs> but his courage is evidently not to be gauged by his size, and besides, he is bald, quite bald. <laughs> <laughs> if we can't knock him down one way, we'll knock him down another way, we can get him some other way. Well, uh, it was probably Stanhouse's writings that made the polygamy pot boil more vigorously than it would have normally. The Honorable Mackenzie Bowell, Minister of Customs, he was later... Uh, Prime Minister, visited Lee's Creek and talked with the people there, but saw no signs of polygamy, but he noted that Mrs. Card was the 74th daughter of Brigham Young. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but this is what he reported in Parliament. The chief purpose of his visit was to investigate a request for entry of several of the plural wives which request had been refused heretofore. Bowell's attitude on the matter changed somewhat to the idea, well, they aren't such bad folks after all. But some of the newspapers who made fun of him feared he might pull a Stenhouse and join the Saints himself. <laughs> Newspaper editors in those days were uh, not very kindly people. Of course, uh, they never got sued as often then as they do now. Um, well, um, in this, it is in this regard that the name Carson first appeared in the news. In replying to a dispatch from Ottawa, Saunders states that a minister cannot change polygamy laws to favor Carston because such legislation is part of the criminal code and only Parliament can change that. He admits that adultery is a breach of the moral but not the criminal code, and he gets a little worked up in this article and somehow manages to distinguish between polygamists and Christians. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how he did it, but that was October the 30th, 1889. I put these dates down in case anybody wants to check up on me sometime. I'll have this all typed up. Maybe someday I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get it published, I don't know. Well, then Stenhouse went at it again. In a letter to the Ottawa Citizen, he says that there is no Canadian law prohibiting, prohibiting either Mormon or Mohammedan polygamy. The illegal aspect of polygamy is only in the deception, he says. During all this time, of course, the Board of Trade was busily working for better mail service to Lee's Creek. And when the tender was finally called in December 1889, the word Carston was used officially and in early 1890, a mail route was established. Uh, so Mr. Stanhouse kept on with his writings. He came up with a new wrinkle. Uh, he had stated that while the law could block a man's marrying more than one woman at different times, there was no law in Canada that stated that he couldn't marry several at one time. <laughs> now, this caused the Canadian Parliament to introduce legislation to block such a possibility, and it was duly passed. I have a reference, uh, the note that I have here is, uh, the uh, Thompson Bill has passed the committee stage, April 16, 1819. Uh, Dr. Palmer told me he knew that this law had been passed, but he never knew why until I told him about A. Maitland Stenhouse and uh, the fact that you should be able to marry a large number of women at any one time. It's tempting, you know. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, uh, the Mormon Church uh, announced the abolition of polygamy as, as a tenet. But <laughs> Maitland Stenhouse didn't stop because an article in the Times uh, of Victoria found Stenhouse promoting polygamy under freedom of contract, which is an American principle that isn't very well considered and certainly not part of English law to any great extent. 
See, freedom of contract has been used by Americans uh, to uh, oppose things like labor unions. That is, if a man wants to work for a dollar a day, no union should force him to take two dollars. That's freedom of contract. This is, that didn't work either. But uh, this is the idea, that a person should be free to make and unmake a marriage contract, contract any time he wants to. Well, uh, the first signs of any local fear of Mormons appeared in the McLeod Gazette, and this was commented on in the news. Um, the Gazette, and I, I could never understand this, I've read through it several times, I can't understand why he got so exercised over this. Uh, because the Mormons decided that they would form a joint stock company to organize all their, their sawmills, flour mills, cheese factories, and mercantile business. But uh, they got up a petition in McLeod to try to stop it, to, to ask the governor to stop it. And, and I think that uh, for a while the um, lieutenant governor of the Northwest Territories actually did stop the incorporation. And uh, I read a later editorial where he said, well, he has no right to do anything of, of this nature. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Saunders in Lethbridge uh, could see some danger of people settling in blocks, but says, well, what is done is done, and we can't see how a petition from the citizens of the cloud can legally stop incorporation. Uh, however, he felt there was a still, danger that, still a danger that this might become a Mormon country, and that no further homestead entries by Mormons should be permitted. Mormonism soon becomes a great political machine. And that's interesting. Because I, uh, in my years in Alberta, I have watched uh, the way the Mormons uh, vote as a political machine. Uh, they have candidates in every party and voters for every party that's come up except the Communist Party, as far as I know. Um, so that uh, they haven't become a solid bloc politically. Uh, but uh, some of my friends have told me that, uh, uh, that there was a time when Mormons were not allowed to buy lots and left, but I haven't found any evidence of that yet. Uh, I, I'll keep looking as I read. Maybe in a couple of years' time, if I give this course again, you maybe come back and find out if that's true or not. Uh, but it's quite strongly believed by a lot of the uh, Mormon people, so there must be some basis to it. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, interestingly enough, um, there was a a copy of the petition, and it says, We the undersigned. But the interesting thing was that we the undersigned was as far as they got, and I never was able to find out the names of the people who signed the petition to block this company. And then nothing appears about the Mormons until October the 15th, 1890, when it was announced that the LDS Church at Salt Lake had abolished polygamy, and uh, a Stenic, um, Stenhouse, of course, had become a real addict, because in November he was still advocating polygamy in another letter to the Victoria Times. Now, this is the point where I ask these, uh, uh, the people around here, uh, this is the way the situation was at the time that Lethbridge was uh, incorporated. I don't know of anybody of the name. I've spoken to a lot of the older, I don't mean elders, but the older Mormon people, and they can't remember Mr. Stenhouse at all or any of his descendants. So I can only assume that he faded out of the LDS picture along with polygamy. Um, But another function of talents of the Mormon people is about to appear. In the numerous articles and advocations of irrigation, this little scrip appeared. Mr. Pierce announced in the Commons that they had sanguine expectations that the Mormons of Lee's Creek would experiment in this direction. So, uh, what with the sports on July the 1st of 1888, and uh, Mormon missionaries uh, and uh, in the irrigation field, uh, that's where I'll have to leave it for the time being.